Hello, my name is Chris and I work at Kvartha Castle Museum and Art Gallery in Merthyr Tydfil. Today, February the 21st, 2021, is a date that everybody should be focusing on a specific bit of Merthyr history, a legendary piece of Merthyr history, to be honest. It was on this day in 1804 that Richard Trevithick ran the first steam locomotive from Pendarren Ironworks all the way down to Abercannan and made history by being the first steam locomotive to run on rails, to carry freight and to carry passengers and essentially changed the entirety of world history with this invention. But what this video is about today is it's going to look at the history of that fateful journey back in February 21st, 1804, but it's going to look at some of the myths that have grown up around it. So the first myth we're going to be looking at is whether or not Pendarren was actually the place that the first steam locomotive ran on rails. We are certainly not the only place to claim ownership over the first railway journey on rails in the world. The very first myth that we're going to try and tackle is one that's perhaps not that well known to Merthyr people because we have been pretty good really at bigging up this world's first kind of steam locomotive, so much so that we've perhaps not noticed that other people have had the claim to the first locomotive railway journey. Now before we get to that, Richard Rithick was born in 1771, he was a Cornish man, he learned his stock and trade through his parents and other family, being involved in mining and engineering in Cornwall and in that region and then eventually working in the mines as mining engineers and lots of other things. So he very much learned his craft on the job. He was a giant of a man, six foot two apparently, known for his strength, but he was a genius inventor. And even long before the names of Colebrookdale and Pendarren came in, he was already revolutionizing steam engines. He near enough perfected a new type of engine, a new type of steam engine that was a high pressure steam engine that totally revolutionized the shape and the style and the look of steam engines at the time and made them work far more efficiently. He would invent a road locomotive that he called the Puffin Devil, which was essentially, you know, an early version of a car, but powered by steam and a steam engine. And so it would run on a road. That also would lead into him creating for a London-based company the first steam carriage, which essentially was a bus. And it was set to replace all the different horse-drawn carriages in the capital at the time. His steam engines were being looked at by industrialists and by people working in ironworks, working in industry. And so in 1802, he was commissioned by Colebrookdale to put in place an engine. Now, if you were to watch certain documentaries and read certain history books, like not long ago, Chris Barry did a series on great British engines off the National Geographic channel, and he outright opens one of the programmes saying, Colebrookdale, this is the place that invented the steam locomotive, and this is where it was first run. Trevithick was commissioned to create an engine to pull different materials around the site on rails at Colebrookdale. They initially though didn't have confidence in the engine and so he commi they commissioned a testing procedure where he put the engine in place and tested it, pumping water out of it and things like that. We had a letter from Trevithick saying that he tested the engine, using it to pump out water and showing that it can have the ability to have some serious power behind it. But then that's where the story ends. We've got a diagram that appears in the Science Museum's archives that shows the Colebrookdale locomotive, but there is no written account anywhere or that has been uncovered yet to say that it was actually run on rails and experimented with. So if you do watch a documentary or read a website or read a book saying the Colebrookdale locomotive was the first place the locomotive journey happened, it is sadly, for them, not for us, wrong. It's probable that it happened, but we've got no information whatsoever. All it will take is a little letter from Richard Rithick or from a colleague or someone on the site of Colebrook Day stating that it did run in 1802 and then everything in Merthyr falls apart and we become second, not first. But until that day, we are first.
the second myth we're going to be taking a look at is that the journey in some way was unsuccessful and that it was a disaster in some ways because I've heard from a lot of different places over the years that it was a failed experiment in some ways for various reasons and so we're going to be looking into that. Another series of myths that has happened a lot around the journey is that it was a failure to some extent. And this is a bit of a weird one because a lot of people say that it made its journey down Abercannon but then didn't make it back and so therefore was a failure in some way. And it's not really strictly true at all really because the whole idea of the trip from Pendaran down to Abercannon was an experiment. And so it all went down to essentially Richard Trevithick being brought to Pendaran Ironworks by Sam Malonfrey to install some of his high pressure steam engines to power different parts of the works, power different parts of the rolling mills, power hammers, all these types of things. But because of Trevithick's insistency on this new technology in terms of attaching it to rails and running it to haul things and, and be that type of engine, rather than a static engine. Richard pushed that and Sam Longfrey was keen to kind of get that off the ground really. Sam Longfrey really invested a massive amount of money and time in Richard Rithick and took ownership over lots of his um, inventions because he was in one of the investors. And so he came to Merthyr and he was assisted by various people within Merthyr as well, which is something that's often forgotten. Richard wasn't on his own doing this work of adapting a static engine to run on rails and run haulage down the valley. A local engineer named Rhys Jones and several other locals really put their work and put their hard effort into creating and adapting Trevithick's engine. Around February 14th, February 15th, they trialled hauling iron up and down on the mountainside around Pendaran Ironworks and seeing that it was sound doing that, they then set a date where they would make a whole journey down to the Abercannon Basin. And as Trevithick said in one of his letters, he was very successful yesterday being February the 21st, 1804, we proceeded on our journey with the engine. We carried 10 tonnes of iron, five wagons and 70 men riding on the whole of the journey, about nine miles, which was performed in four hours and five minutes. It had a top speed of around four to five miles an hour. So breakneck pace going down to Abercannon. But a lot of this journey has been marred by news that it was ineffective and lumbering on its way down. And in general, a lot of people seem to focus on it being a failure in some ways, but it wasn't. The whole idea was to test it, carrying iron and carrying passengers down over a certain distance and nine and a half miles or nine and three quarter miles is a massive distance for 1804 and for this type of steam engine to achieve particularly when you've got 70 passengers and 10 tons of weight pulling it down really the truth of the matter is is it was meant to go all the way down and all the way back up but it failed because a bolt came loose on the steam engine and water came out and it couldn't then top it up and warm it up so it was dragged back up. The other issue was that it was crushing the railway tracks as it went down because they weren't railway tracks. They were tramway tracks, pretty much predominantly made of cast iron and they weren't used to the weight because Trevithick's idea, because the traction on the wheels well, it meant that it was spinning on the rails when it went on because metal on metal in a wet environment was making the wheels spin. And so he thought, well, I'll add more weight to the engine to weigh it down to lessen the spin. But then that created its own problems by weighing the tra tracks down and literally snapping the tracks. So they had to lay new tracks down. And so to travel nine and a three quarter miles down and then a couple of miles back up without any faults, is amazing in every way so the journey was not a failure the last myth we're going to be looking into regarding Richard Trevithick and this monumental kind of journey down Pendar and to Abercannon was something that people have latched on for many many years and that is a wager between Samuel Humphrey and supposedly Richard Crochet and that that wager was not paid by Richard Crochet and so we're going to be delving into the story behind that wager myth in the Pendaran locomotive history is so difficult to sift through and get through it's ridiculous to be honest because as most of the letters from Richard Trevithick and from Samuel Humphrey state 
there was a wager and that's why February the 21st was set because that was the day that they were going to try and accomplish this wager. Now what had happened is history books and history in general tells us that Samuel Humphrey had a wager with Richard Crochet that the engine would be able to make that journey down and back and carry a certain amount of haulage and generally perform better than horses. And so they bet 500 guineas but then the myth is that Richard Crochet didn't pay that wage because the journey was incomplete. But the problem is, is that even identifying that Richard Crochet was the man who made the wager in the first place is hard enough. Because in all the letters, it's named as a gentleman, Bet Samuel Humphrey. And there's no first-hand primary account of, that I can find at least, I'm definitely open to being educated on this if someone else has got it. But there's no letter from the time stating that Richard Crochet was the man to make the bet. Later on, it suggests that the bet wasn't paid out because Mr Hill, who is Richard Hill of the Plymouth Works, who used to work in Cabartha and was the father of Anthony Hill, who many may remember from running the Plymouth and Pendrebark Works in Merthyr. Some historians said that Richard Hill was the man who they give their 500 guineas a piece to to hold the bet and then to pay it out when the bet was made and done. Now initially the letter from Terrific states that the gentleman that bet 500 guineas against it rode the whole of the journey with us and is satisfied that he lost the bet. So that was in February 22nd, 1804. But then if we go further, there's a letter from Samuel Humphrey dated the 10th of July, 1804, that states Mr. Hill does not yet allow the 500 guineas because he did not return again with the empty trams in the same time as horses usually do. There's two things from that letter. One is that Trevithick didn't make just one journey, he made two and possibly even three journeys. Most of those have been totally forgotten by the history books, but he certainly made more than one journey down to Abercannon and back. But both times he had issues coming back because the boiler had certain mechanical faults. The other thing is that it states some stipulations in the bet that he didn't do it in the same time as horses usually do, implying that the bet was the engine could outdo horses in some way, shape and form. Then there's also another letter from Richard Trevithick. He said the tram engine carried two loads of 10 tons to the ship in place. Mr. Hill says he will not pay the bet because there were some tram plates in the tunnel removed as to get the rail into the middle of the arch. And they adapted a lot of the current rail see because they were breaking and they changed certain things to actually fit the engine through certain tunnels and smaller narrow gaps. Now, Hill says that the trackway has changed from the original bet, therefore making the bet null and void. So there was another objection there from Mr. Hill. In all of these letters going back and forth though, Mr. Crochet, Richard Crochet, is not mentioned in any of them. And I've been, I've been looking, seriously looking hard to try and find where on earth Mr. Crochet comes into this picture. And I just haven't been able to find it whatsoever. The only name associated with the bets, the only two iron masters anyway associated with the bets, is Mr. Richard Hill and Mr. Samuel Humphrey. Richard Hill may have been holding the money for Crochet and Humphrey, but I don't see where that's written down. I don't understand how people have come to that conclusion. So either I'm missing a massive part of the puzzle, or Mr. Hill was the Iron Master who had the bet that he didn't pay out on, and nor Richard Crochet. So this is a bit of a weird myth, really. But certainly the bet wasn't paid out but I really need to find out for definite if Crochet was involved at all because that's the prominent story that we grow up with. The Crochet didn't pay out this bet because of certain things. Richard Rissick went on from Pendaren as well to make uh, locomotives in Newcastle and many other places. So the Pendaren locomotive very much is that kind of key moment and key turning point in his career really. But sadly for Richard Dravithic, a lot of it was unfortunately kind of unsuccessful in many ways. As he wrote himself, I thought this experiment showed to the public quite enough to recommend it to general use. But though a thing that promised to be so much consequence has so far remained buried, which discourages me again from trying to practice it at my own expense. 
because he was investing a lot of his own time and money creating these exhibitions of the locomotive strength and power. I mean, even in 1808, he had he opened a public accessible kind of railway route, really, and it was just a large circle, and it was called Catch Me Who Can. In effect, that was the first passenger paid railway journeys in the history of the world. But again, it went away and nothing really came of it. And nothing really would come massively of the steam engines and Richard Rithick's inventions until at least 20 or so years after the Pendown locomotives was in place. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed listening to a bit about the history that happened on the 21st of February back in 1804. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and please share it and like it and spread it around as much as you can. Thank you very much for watching and hoi vau.